My name is David Klarbaut. I am an artist. I don't know exactly what it is I'm doing. It seems to me that I'm changing my ways all of the time. Uh, but I am a self-taught, uh, very hungry autodidact um, in, in the domain of the moving image, animation, film, video. And what we could call virtual image making. So welcome to our uh, old Flemish house slash studio. Well, on Friday nobody's uh, really working, so every desk has uh, someone working. Most of the time it's the same project, so it's one project at a time. Exceptionally, there will be a beginning of something new and uh, ending of something that we're just finishing. Um, but that's where most of the work is done. That's where most of the discussions are done. Uh, we actually have a lot of space, but we'll kind of stick to these two small rooms for some reason. <laughs> Basically what defines um, my practice in my studio is that we were never trained in anything that we do, or that I do. And um, I guess that characterizes a little bit also the hy hybridity of um, what I work in. I'm also a draftsman, I draw a lot. I make a lot of study work on my own while the rest of the team is uh, working on their computers and doing what it is they're doing. I'm doing the very simplest of um, work on paper. And so, but my origins are in painting and in drawing and in uh, lithography. So, well, that's a long time ago. And I started very early. I started when I was age eight, nine. And by the time that I was age, 23, 24, I was heavily depressed with art and with what it was I could contribute. Um, I felt everything had been done. Um, it's difficult to say what I was a proponent of, but I, was, I knew what I was against. <laughs> and I was against, uh, I, I knew my work wouldn't be, um, wouldn't have anything shocking. Um, it wouldn't have, it would fight with uh, um, narration, it would fight with, uh, it would be against what uh, Jean Baudrillard so beautifully called uh, 3D information, meaning information about an image, uh, readable, knowledgeable, um, but which in the end doesn't, you know, doesn't add anything to, uh, to, to the picture you're looking at. And I became very much aware that I wanted to uh, work in, develop a language which uh, when you would uh, dissect different particles of, or the different partitions of, of my work, you wouldn't be able to say exactly what it was about. My practice became a practice of partly thinking your way through an image speaking about it with the team or with the people that you are uh, um, confident with, that you feel you trust. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's very loud here and very hot. This is a cluster of around uh, 40 processors that are uh, rendering day and night when we are uh, making a film. We do everything in-house. It's kind of nice, warm, and you can make mistakes, start again. But um, I've been checked by the police because they thought we were uh, uh, growing weed. And because our electricity bill goes up dramatically when we are uh, shooting, uh, or actually when we are rendering, sorry. 
But then there's this other aspect which comes back time and again is what what is it uh, what is it that binds everything together and um if I'd had to sum it up, it would probably be the the fight, the conflict between clock time or atomized time, divided time, overdefined duration, seconds, milliseconds, atoms, and um, what we I don't know if it's actually a used term, but I call it heterochrony. Uh, it's the plurality of duration, which is frightening in a way, because it means that you no longer can define a space of time. And uh, paradoxically, I'm, I'm trying to find heterochrony in a medium that um, is overdefined by clock time, by, for example, 25 frames per second, are an over-definition of time, and within that you have privileged moments, um, as it happens in cinema, or strong psychological moments, as it happens in cinema. And I'm, I'm trying, in whatever I do, to move away from there. and to So that's how I come about to make pieces that last a millennium, or 15 hours, um, or even that can be, uh, in the case of King, a loop of 10 minutes. I had a rough idea of an image which I had in my archive for a long time of uh, Elvis as a young man at the brink of stardom, but not quite yet. And he still had something baby-like, childlike, youth-like. He even, you know, he had a, a, a body which was not developed like it would be nowadays, where you would first sculpt the body and then make, produce the star out of that. So he was, he was soft and mushy in a way. <laughs> and there had been this, uh, a German immigré, Alfred Wertheimer, who had been allowed a week with him because none of the other uh, well-known photographers would wanted to do it. And he said, okay, I'll do it. And he spent, he made hundreds of shots and I, I, I was interested. There was one that caught my eye because Elvis was not at the center of the attention. Uh, or not at the center of the composition. He was somewhere outside. And I love uh, pictures that don't have a particular core or a particular depth, a particular point towards everything narrows down. Again, it's this um, resistance to information in, in pictures, I imagine, that, that I was interested in. And I left this image in my archive for a long time. And at one point I realized that um, I started researching. So I started gathering I images of Elvis. And I got more and more drawn towards the images of his naked skin. Hands, arms, upper body, feet, legs. And started collecting all of those. And then I felt slightly like um, I would be this uh, Nazi German doctor who would do awf awful things with, uh, with experiments with the patients. And I started developing this idea that I wanted to work with the pieces of skin of Elvis, all of the pieces of skin that I had gathered from Elvis through the internet and libraries, books, and I had hundreds of those, and we started stitching them together. And from there, it wasn't very far-fetched to imagine, let's find an Elvis lookalike. And we scanned the guy. 
which was not so satisfying. So we scanned another guy and then we made a Frankenstein monster out of the two. And then we started virtually digitally stitching the skin on <laughs> on uh, the lookalike. So the lookalike disappeared underneath Elvis's skin. And I got interested in this transformation process. And from there, the idea of making a 360 degree journey around the details of that room in which he's photographed with the furniture, the deep soft carpet in which he's standing, the varnished wood, which was typical for American houses of the 1950s, which reflect a lot of light. And of course, at many occasions in the image, you can see the light moving because the camera is moving, but you never see a camera. So I thought, aha, the camera is a vampire, isn't it? The virtual camera is, it's, it's a sign of death, yeah, because you have, uh, when you have life, you will always have an operator and you will always have a camera and you will always have a mutual authentication between those two. But when you are in virtual image making, it's Dracula. He's no longer reflect, reflected in the mirror. I would say King was one of the more easygoing works in the sense that we had a, we had a, a a core figure, which was the star Elvis. Everything was around him. Um, but in a way then also not, because everything in the image is about something else. It's about skin, about birthmarks, about his wet pants. He just comes from out of the swimming pool, his, the bottle of Pepsi-Cola, um, the reflections on the bottle of Pepsi-Cola, the reflections on the table, the package of Marlboro which is reflected on the notebook and then the figures which are standing around which happen to be there accidentally which we try to represent or recreate as faithfully as possible. Um, works like King taught me a lot about where it is that we're going through towards in terms of optics and in terms of um, the relation that we permanently have between our thinking and our perception. And this is our, uh, so we have two recording studios, one which is in the south of town, which is very long and, and low. Um, where we can only do certain sets and then we have this one which was our first one which is quite high uh, but very short so it's you always have to choose between uh, between the two and then we have storage spaces on the side where basically almost everything that you could think of for video production um, is here so we just have to take it off the shelves and use it which kind of it's easy. You, the day before you think we should maybe do this or that uh, setup as a tryout, and the next day you just do it. You don't wait for budgets or you don't wait for people. You can pretty much uh, organize things yourself. And that was the idea behind the studio always, is that we would be able to move rapidly. I've always thought that um, one of the privileges that an artist has is to um, have time to waste like no one else, in a way, and to use labor or the intensity of labor. Uh, you could also say the volume or the expense in money terms or in effort. Uh, which no other economy uh, allows itself because everything is supposed to be efficient. An artist does, in a way, is exempt of that, does not have to be efficient. So in, often before I, I try to use labor as a, as a shape, as a real presence, where um, people who would look at my work would say, why on earth would he be 
making something that long, some, some, that extensive, something that tiresome. And the pure necessity is no exception, it's probably the culmination of it. I started off with uh, the well-known uh, Disney animation The Jungle Book of 1967 which is an icon of energetic uh, cinema. It's all about movement. If you look at the incredible animations of that day, uh, there's not a single nerve in the fictional characters that's still. This Baloo character is it's like moving all the time. It would absolutely be um, a, a attention deficit disorder person. Yeah? It's constantly in action and so it goes for the whole flow of the film. It's a film which is uh, a tribute to modern positivism, uh, building up a society, protecting the weak, uh, where the predators even change their uh, approach to the, to, to, the, to the prey and make an exception for once, they'll grow up the little fellow called Mowgli, protected. They want to keep it in the family. I talked about the confidence system before. We are there again at the confidence system. It's part of being in one family. So that's 1967. And then when you look at the year 2020 or the hour time, you notice something odd when you make the mental exercise or the thinking experiment of what would be happening to the characters of 1967. We never saw them again. They never appeared again. There was no sequel, except very differently looking. And I imagine they're, they have retired. They're very old, they're lonely. At the time when I got the idea for the pure necessity, I was actually doing a lot of research for another piece in animal parks, where animals are bored. And they almost have uh, nervous tics. They develop uh, uh, pathologies when it comes to uh, their uh, enclosures. and. Um, and from one came the other, the idea was born to do the negative version of the Jungle Book, where all the energy would seem to be sucked out and be changed in a negative energy, a laziness. All these things which fundamentally don't belong to the, the moving image, because the moving image is a definition of movement. Animation is a celebration of life, of inert matter. So, the ideology behind any moving image will always be life. So death is excluded. That's probably why there's such a fascination for death in, the, in, in cinema. This place is, serves for many things. When we did the Pure Necessity, we had uh, our animation studio here. So there were two rows of table with 13 or 14 people walking, uh, working on their uh, Kintex, these digital drawing tablets that you can... Uh, um, but it's still a lot of handwork, a lot of labor. What I think I, I aim for is that over duration, as you sit and watch, something ever so small, ever so slight changes inside of you, not inside of the film. It's not what happens in the film that matters, it's what happens inside of you and your own relation to the time that you spend 
uh, with your own being in a particular room. That's the, I think it's one of the fallacies of, of looking at images is that you kind of tend to forget your own breathing and your own passage of time. And I'm trying to look for something which could bring in equal measure the awareness of one's own time and the duration in, uh, in the image, which is fundamentally artificial. Basically, I think when you make a film, you make it like you, an architect or anyone would build a house. You build it either from the core outwards or you build it from the outside inwards. And uh, the confetti piece was built from the outside, from the periphery towards the center. Um, I think I was very much afraid of what I would find in the center because it had um, it had a very delicate center. Um, it's one of these mute works. It's one of these silent works again that um, are about sound and are about a scream. In the center of the work, there's a young guy. He's one of the few children in a scene with a hundred people celebrating something, clapping their hands with a lot of confetti coming down. Who, uh, he's one of the few children there, and he's the only one who's um, not directed upwards to what's happening in the light and in this confetti coming down. And the confetti is basically there to break up the light and to make a baroque sense of uh, diffused light which goes in all directions but has no depth. And he's the only one who's crying, who's shouting out loud from the bottom of his being, which in reality was a studio sequence with him alone and his mom. And the whole team, everybody was shouting as loud as they could. We, we didn't record that, of course. And we, uh, we recorded him, this little boy, at a single moment in time with a group of around between 45 and 50 cameras. Out of that, out of this cry, we built a scan or a 3D model of him. And that's how we came to have a zombie slash screaming zombie, young child, in the middle of a situation which um, is celebration. At the beginning of the idea is always somehow two things, two things that don't live together. And in the confetti piece it's this sound or absence of sound, and then there's this festivity. Uh, this baroque aspect of um, a lot of movement, a lot of turmoil, but very superficial in a way. Um, there's another reading which I never speak about, uh, which is that about class separation. And um, everyone, all of these figures in the confetti piece are people who look better off and who are in a situation where everything is well off and where everything is going fine, even more than fine, it's very festive. So probably it's against this um, let's make things better culture or let's the culture of change. Where have we heard that? Let's change, let's make it better, let's move forward. And um, which is a guarantee for depression, by the way. The confetti piece is about uh, 
it's about many things. On one hand, it's about volume of confetti and of space and of this thing coming down. It's also, I think, very much about digital matter, virtual matter, and how, how do we live with it? In how far is it real? In how far is it, do we, do we not trust it? Um, but we are, human beings are trusting people. We are, we are programmed to believe. We're programmed to trust. We're not programmed um, to put our senses into question. Not systematically. So we'll first be spontaneous believers and then we will be analytical. Welcome to my little drawing room. This is basically where I do most of the uh, solo work. <laughs> the writing, the drawing. I write a lot. But I don't publish very much because it's so time consuming. Uh, but on the other hand, I try to lecture a little bit more often. Um, and most of the preparations I do here, I have some of my books here. And um, the drawing happens here also. Um, in the beginning, this was, not, this was a room that we had for uh, interns. When international interns came, they could live here. And then I uh, started to draw a little bit more and I needed a place for my own, so I took this. One of the particularities of the digital era is that in we, we got rid of the loop, the idea of a loop, and the neurotic aspect of looping over and over. You also slowly see it disappearing in collective consciousness, that loop. That life is no longer looked upon as a, a tape which runs from beginning to end. Um, or the days just don't begin and end. They're not, they're not loops. And digital allows you, or virtual allows you, to break open this um, triangle or this trinity between... Or it becomes a, there becomes a trinity between the past, the present and the future they kind of seem to occupy the same space in the virtual realm. And um, so uh, a cry or a, a shout or a, a scream can coexist with, with, um, with a festivity. Disaster can coexist with festivity. And a moment ago I, s I did this. Two, and I think everything's built out of two, in one way or another. Our brain is built out of two sides. Um, we have in everything we do, we have a redundancy built in. If one doesn't work, the other takes over. But we also have the binary. Computing power exists only out of zeros and ones. And in my work, there will always be two opposing situations, practically always. In the confetti piece, it's the noise and the silence in uh, the pure necessity. It is uh, laziness and energy. Um, but it also is... Um, modern cinema and individual, individuality of our time, where we no longer share uh, directly by sitting together. Um, so there's always this aspect of two things that shouldn't, shouldn't coexist, but which I try to coexist, never, to, 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 to bring together nevertheless. I have, uh, and I still have, I still have a problem with the idea of the masterpiece. 
the piece made by the master um, as something that you could grasp, as something that you could take and have and own. Um, in that sense, I'm probably a real fam filmmaker. Um, is that uh, I don't... Uh, I, I, the, the art really has to be without matter, without a uh, particular shape. We perform it and at the end of the exhibition the performance is over and then we can perform it again. Uh, but there's no such thing as this um, incredibly expensive, valuable, singular uh, artwork. That is situated somewhere in time, not in a particular matter. That's very important to me. That there would be no, uh, nothing that can be adored, nothing particular that can be adored, but somewhere in the small folds of time, yeah, there are encounters, important ones.